Hello, welcome to our Q&A for the Showtime miniseries, The Good Lord Bird. My name is Chris Lemaire and I'm a programmer at the American Cinematheque. Uh, and I'm so excited to present this conversation with the creator and star of the series, Ethan Hawke. Uh, I wanna start by thanking Showtime uh, for partnering with us on this event. I also wanna thank our amazing American Cinematheque members tuning in uh, for your continued support. If you're not a member, I encourage you to visit our website, americancinematech.com, uh, to find out about all the perks your membership gets you uh, and also how it supports our mission. Uh, our conversation uh, today is gonna be moderated by Matt zoller Seitz, who is the editor at large at rogerebert.com uh, and also the TV critic for New York Magazine. Uh, I know we're eager to jump in here. So I'd, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Matt uh, and welcome Ethan Hawke. Okay, so here we are talking about uh, the Good Lord Bird and John Brown, and I guess the best place to start is uh, Ethan. If you could maybe tell me, how long have you been interested in John Brown? Where did this fascination begin? Well, you know, when I was first taught about John Brown as a kid, I was just taught that he was a lunatic. <laughs> you know, I, I I wasn't taught why he took over Harper's Ferry. I wasn't taught why he was hung. I just took was taught he was a lunatic and uh you know it was strange my parents split up when I was young and my father lived in Texas and my mother was living in Vermont and so I I got very different stories about the Civil War you know <laughs> yeah. from the the tale of northern aggression you know to we saved the union I I heard both of them and uh but everybody was always scared of tell talking about John Brown yes and uh I I came across through a wild story. I ended up coming across the, the book, A Good Lord Bird. And there was something about the wit and love and silliness that McBride approached this very verboten subject matter hmm. uh, that was completely disarming to me. And I thought it was radical and beautiful and it made me upset that more people didn't know this part of our story because if you if you tell the story of America without John Brown, you're deliberately turning your eye away from a, a, a major crime and a part of the uh, DNA of this country and the founding of this country and the building of this country and its response to the Civil War. And so I, I just thought it was incredibly interesting, but it wasn't told in a way that was like your high school librarian was telling it. It was telling it as Red Fox or Richard Pryor, or Chris Rock <laughs> might tell you the abolitionist tale. Or Mark Twain. Was, yeah, I mean, it's definitely in the, in the uh, vein of Mark Twain and that kind of tall tale aspect and unreliable narrator aspect. And it was, it was so exciting to me that I wanted everybody to read the book. And then slowly I realized, hey man, let's make a movie out of this sucker. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, you mentioned uh, getting an alternative view of the Civil War from growing up in Texas. I'm, I, I also grew up in Texas. And it wasn't until I was well into my mid-20s that I, that I heard a, a detailed alternative version of, of the Reconstruction period uh, <laughs> in which uh, uh, white people were not the good guys. It's really, I mean, it's amazing how they can tell the story of the Alamo and have us coming off well. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, yeah. it's amazing to me the fact that there's been like 9,000 movies of the Alamo made and not one, this is the first like major reenactment on film of the battle at Harper's Ferry. Yeah. It, it, it tells you a lot about how this country likes to tell stories. I mean, you know, even, even the people, you know, who are passionate about those statues of Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee and stuff, their claim to thinking it's important is, is history. Right. And, and that's really interesting because you don't drive through Berlin and see statues of Goebbels and Rommel and, uh, you know, I mean, you, you lose a war that's a lost cause. You don't get to hang your heroes trophies up, you know, no. it's an, it's an inaccurate telling of history. And it's what, there was a wonderful woman that ran the civil war museum down in Richmond, Virginia. And she used to say this incredible thing is that, that the South suffered a major, major loss of pride and, uh, in the Civil War. And the North decided to kind of do a gentleman's agreement and make them feel better about it. Uh, and it, 
it, it, it froze everybody in the first stage of grief, which is denial. Mm. And she kind of says that all those statues just represent denial about That's what happened and, and why it happened. Mm. And it was it was very interesting. And, and so the process, I, I would I'd be I got driven to work by lots of different, you know, uh, Teamsters it, because I I had so many lines to learn. I never I would drive myself home sometimes, but I could never drive myself there. And if you're wondering how that happened, my wife was a producer and she would drive herself and do her own thing, but and drive me home. But so I'd run all these lines with different Teamsters and they're all from Virginia and everybody had a different hit on John Brown. You know, one driver would say to me, you're not making him a good guy, are you? Mm. And another guy would say, it's about time we heard his story. And somebody else would say, who the hell is he again? Mm -hmm. Is all this mm -hmm. stuff true? It's, it's amazing how much he puts his finger on a lot of things people are avoiding or things people have passion about. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you can certainly make a case for, for John Brown as maybe the ultimate American example of the idea that a, a terrorist is somebody on the other side. <laughs> yeah. You know, because really he was a terrorist. He was he was by any definition a terrorist. This was a guy who, you know, if you, meant, were, if you were black, he wasn't a terrorist. Absolutely not. But I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, by the definitions that we use when we're talking about, you know, organizations like Al Qaeda, this yeah. was a this was a guy who was politically, ideologically motivated. And his point of view was this evil is so great that nothing we can do is as bad as this evil. That yes. seems to be his baseline point of view. And, and so he was, I mean, as you obviously, you know, he was riding through with his with his band of, of merry marauders, uh, pulling, you know, the officials from these pro-slavery towns out of their homes in the middle of the night and killing them, killing yeah, them. Yeah, we reenacted, chopped yeah. off their heads. Yeah, and, you know, and we, I didn't learn about any of that stuff in school. No, well, the reason why they don't want to tell you about any of that stuff is you, if you really want to get into it, you know, you have to discuss human bondage is a lot worse than, you know, it was painted in my childhood. You know, <laughs> there's, there's massive sex trafficking happening. There's human atrocities. Um, there's, you know, these, it, it was such a criminal act uh, against another people that to, to teach it is very upsetting to young people. And it's very upsetting, I think, to the way that Americans wanted to see themselves. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think you're right to say that John Brown was a terrorist in many ways, but by that definition, so was George Washington. I mean, you, you right. know, it, 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 it's like everybody who fights for freedom is a terrorist unless they win, right? Right, you know? exactly. And, and, Ho Chi Minh. Uh, yeah, you know, in a in a country that, you know, as proof of John Brown's insanity as trial, all they did is, is say, you know, do you believe that women and black people should have the same rights as a white male? And he said, yes. And they said, no further proof necessary. I mean, he's <laughs> obviously nuts. So if you're living in an insane society, it, it's very, very hard. I mean, and on the, the, to your point, he also chopped people's heads off, killed people. He believed he had spent his life as a nonviolent abolitionist. I mean, one of the things as an actor that I found absolutely fascinating is most radicals, ideologues who take up arms are extremely young. Mm -hmm. You know, they get, they get charged with their idealism and they lead a revolution. And John Brown was an old man. He was. And, and, and that's very, very rare. And I think that to understand his violence, you have to understand that he had spent all of his life as a nonviolent abolitionist. His father was a nonviolent abolitionist. His grandfather was a nonviolent abolitionist. Right. They were, his grandfather rode with George Washington and was so offended by the Constitution that he broke and became an abolitionist. And, and that's the home that John Brown lived in. And so he's sitting there in a farm in New Paltz trying to help escaped slaves learn how to farm. You know, he was he was teaching escaped slaves how to do that, the creation of Timbuktu up there. And uh, and then they passed the Dred, Dred Scott Act, which made what he was doing illegal. And so you, you see how a man in his 50s could be charged. Yes. And I, I personally believe that, I think he went down to bloody Kansas to be killed. I think, you know, his he was already pretty megalomaniacal and, Yes, you know he his relationship, his primary relationship on this planet was 
to the divine, right? I mean, he yes, really wasn't worried martyred. about what he, he to be to be martyred. Yeah. And I think there was, I always thought there was a psychological component to that in addition to the religious one, which is, you know, he, religiously, he wanted to be martyred for the cause, religiously and politically, but also uh, if he got taken out of the action early, then he didn't have to see this thing through to the end. You know, well, I, I, that's I not that. about that. I don't, I, I, having studied his letters and things like that, I, I don't think there's any part of him that didn't want to be leading a revolution in the um, Blue Ridge Mountains. I, I think he would have loved to have seen it. He wanted Frederick Douglass to be there. And he wanted, I mean, he, he envisioned himself as a, once Frederick Douglass didn't come, I think he started thinking of himself on a journey like Samson. You know, yeah. I mean, then, it be, then it became a suicide mission. But I don't think he was trying to cop out. I, I mean, I think he was, I, Oh, I didn't mean cop, I didn't mean cop out. I just meant you know it's a long that's a long hard road to choose for yourself. I had a funny you know the fun thing about being an actor is you you just try to make all this stuff personal, right? So I was trying yeah. to think about really what motivated him to violence. And to your point, I went up to his house in New. I went to his gravesite where his boys are buried and uh, where he's buried and. Uh, saw his wife's kitchen and then their house and where she lived after he died. And yeah. they have all the stories about how they got the body back up there and the protests. And you see the, you know, you see the view from his bedroom window, you know, you see the mirror that he shaved in and you, 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 mm -hmm. you stand in that extremely humble um, house, you know, I mean, this very, it's got that shaker, pristine kind of Amish feel to it. Right. <laughs> and um, incredible that it's the, still standing. It, yeah, it is incredible. But so the tour guide showed me a bunch of his letters, the sweet man who ran the place. And he, shortly before he went off to Kansas, there's a marketed change in his handwriting. And the, this mm. is just the tour guide riffing, right? But he's like, I think he had a stroke. Mm. And I, I think he went down there charged with his own mortality mm. and that he didn't really think he had much longer to live anyway. Mm. I mean, think about it. It's, he would already he was already an old man you know 50 something was old back then right right and and uh so i started i started taking that on as a person that was basically every battle was welcoming looking forward to seeing jesus you know right the sweet embrace yeah yeah it, it was he was not afraid yeah 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 i i i also am struck by the you know, a lot of historians, as you know, believe that the Civil War originated in this story, like that this was the this was the 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 spark that lit the fuse that led to the actual war between the states, as they called it. Where you we're can, from, you can make a strong case to be made that the Harper's Ferry battle is the first battle of the Civil War. I mean, I, I you know, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, Stonewall Jackson, John Wilkes Booth were all at John Brown's hanging, right? Right. I mean, right. They, they were all there, man. Mm -hmm. the, the sales for um, Winchester rifles went up like 2000 percent the six months after Harper's Ferry. Mm. You know, it was, uh, you know, you could, a couple months later, Lincoln was elected. 18 months later, the war is on. You know? It's interesting. It almost reminds me of how, you know, the later subsequently discovering that so many of the people who were involved in Al Qaeda had fought the Soviets in Afghanistan. Yeah. You know, they were, they, a lot of these guys knew each other. Yeah. Make, you know, make common cause uh, dictated by time and place. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm actually belief. surprised, really, honestly, uh, as much time has elapsed, I'm still surprised that, that you were able to get this made. I am too. And I think we, snuck it through, meaning that when I first approached James McBride about playing John Brown, Obama was president and things weren't as hot as they feel right now. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the temperature in the country ratcheted. I mean, you know, the issues of social justice have been a part of this country's story since its inception. So it's nothing new. But the temperature went up and the pandemic cranked it up. Trump cranked it up. The pandemic cranked it up. And I think that it would be near impossible to make today. And it was 
definitely impossible a couple of years before McBride wrote this book. Mm -hmm. um, so in some strange way, I think we, we just kind of found our way through the door. I feel very grateful that we were allowed to make this, this, this show. I, uh, it was an honor of my life to, I, I really, I had that big beard on and the guns and I'm standing in front of Harper's Ferry and I was really blown away that, you know, I made light of it earlier, but you know, all the war movies I've seen, you know, and, and this is one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard. A group of black guys and white guys getting together to overthrow the nation's largest armory in hopes of provoking a, a civil war. Yeah, it's like an American Braveheart. It's, it's unbelievable. It's just so scary to talk about because it's a lot of things that none of us really enjoy looking at. And, um, and so what McBride did is made it, made you look at it made, because it's not told from John Brown's point of view. It's not John Brown's story. It's Onion's story. Mm -hmm. It's Henry Shackelford, you know, Hon Henry Onion Shackelford's story. And so that's what gives it the Twain vibe. You know, it has a little Huck Finn air to it. And it's, it's seen from a, you know, strange point of view, you know, it's not seen head on. You're not, you're not asked to like John Brown. One of my first scenes, I chop somebody's head off. Yeah. You're being told right off the bat that he's a lunatic. You don't yes. have to like him, but, and it, it manages to tell the story uh, in a very, very sly way, which I really, really appreciated. Well, there's another aspect to the way the story is told that I found striking. And, and, and that is that it, um, it kind of, de as, as you allude to, it sort of decenters John Brown a little bit. And, uh, you know, you would have no reason to know this, but like over 20 years ago, uh, I was working on a, a treatment for a miniseries about John Brown with John Frankenheimer. Amazing. And, we, and, we, and I, I wrote a 40 page treatment, and this was the summer of 2000. And John unfortunately died the following year, so it never happened. But at the time, he, he, he loved John Brown. He was fascinated by him, and he wanted to shoot this thing in black and white and make it look like Matthew Brady photos from the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And uh, he warned me, he said, you know, this is probably never going to get made and all your, all your work will have been for nothing because nobody wants to tell this story. Like nobody wants to tell a story where black people pick up arms against their oppressors. They only want to see stories about people suffering, eventually receiving transcendence uh, yeah. and, and, being, and being rescued by the white man. And in fact, that's the vast majority of slavery narratives that are told in this country. And, and you know what's incredible was this was going to be based on uh, the book uh, Raising Holy Hell by Bruce Olds. Mm. And um, there was another book at the time. Was it Cloud Splitter? Yeah, yeah, Russell Banks. Scorsese was going to make that, you know. Uh, I think part of what made this makeable was the fact that you have one of this country's leading African-American novelists writing the novel and that it's told it's not a white person telling uh, a white Christian savior story. It's a black person telling the story of somebody who thinks he's a white Christian savior and is a lunatic. You know? <laughs> and so right. it's, 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 it's got the angle on it where you can see both the hypocrisy of John Brown and you can see the courage of John Brown. You can see the faith of him and you can see most clearly how screwed up human behavior is and how full of foibles we are and how each generation is born into this ongoing problem. You know, we, we, don't, we, we don't create the situation of our birth, right? We're, we're, we're a firecracker inserted in the middle of a long string of firecrackers that were going off long before we get here. So we're all responding to it. Yeah. One of the things, one of the things McBride used to say to me is like, be careful when you cast the white racist. He goes, if you give them horns, then black suffering isn't real. He's like, you know, all these Southern boys, these, you know, Confederate soldiers, these guys are love their mom. They're good to their animals. They took care of their grandma. They protected their sister and they were racist. Yes. You know, and, and, and so that's a more complicated truth to swallow. And it's much know? more, and it's much more frightening. It's much more frightening. They're not evil. They're people who are, um, who are not, 
who are, are thinking in a short-term gain. They're following society the way a lot of us follow society. And they're playing by rules that are working for them and turning a blind eye to the suffering of others, which is very common even today. You know, I, I had a, I had a years ago, I had a big fight with a friend of mine about a certain type of story. And it was something like, you know, the TV show, the Americans, the Godfather films and so on, where uh, murderers and criminals are also portrayed as people who love their kids and, and, are, and are great family men and so on. And he said, I don't believe that somebody who is capable of committing and ordering multiple murders could truly love anyone. And I said, I, I do. <laughs> I do. And, and, that, and that disjunction between those two ideas is what is so disturbing. I mean, listen, one of the first things that pops to my mind is Harry Truman. You know? I believe that Harry Truman loved his wife from all, this is a very fine husband, you know, from all accounts. And this guy dropped two bombs <laughs> on Japan and he really didn't have to. No, he certainly didn't have to drop two. He certainly, and in truth, what no even if you could make the case for one, you which you, you I don't think you can. You could, well, there were two. The, the biggest reason to drop the bomb on those innocent people in Japan, you know, or those women and children and older people, and you, you know, these is is to perpetuate the Cold War. I mean, you know, is to let is to scare Russia, and it, it's like, and I think. People, you know, what's the famous Stalin quote? You know, one death is a tragedy and a million is a statistic. I mean, <laughs> you know, people, right. leaders, leaders get into this line of thinking, you know, where they, they protect temporary greed, temporary fears. You know, they, they're not thinking beyond the next 10 years. And uh, I, I think that very fine loving people are capable of gross atrocities. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I mean, I, I think about it all the time. I think about like my grandkids, you know, are they gonna, you drove in a car? Yeah. Didn't you, you ate meat? Hadn't you heard what it was doing to the climate? Yeah. How could, what, you, you know, and they'll be looking at pictures of traffic jams. You were in one of these, you know? And you're like, yeah, why? And you're like, well, I, I had to get to work and 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 it was easier than getting a bike. But didn't you know? And you're like, I, I kind of did know. I went to the I went to the zoo a couple of days ago and I thought, um, why do we have these? These are jails for 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 sentient creatures, you know, which is not a thought that would have occurred to me even five years ago. So yeah, it's it's amazing how how our thinking gradually evolves and we may not even be aware that it's happening. And most of us don't wanna really look at what's happening at the slaughterhouses. You know, we, they, we don't wanna look at what that's doing to the environment, what that's doing. It, it, you know, it's, it, it's not about like, it's extremely destructive act if you're considering us shepherds of this earth, you know? I mean, it, it's, so it, I don't wanna look at it, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, and so I think that, Often that's how, you know, quote unquote, sin happens. It's just people thinking about this Wednesday. I don't, I can't take on the responsibility of, you know, the planet, uh, the culture, yes. the, the country. I barely got, you know, I can barely take care of my family. I and mean, that's how most of us feel. Well, that's a natural segue to ask you something else about the way this story is told, which is uh, another thing that differentiates this particular telling of the story from all of the others that I've read is that you are not locked in the head of John Brown for the entire time. And not only is the attention of the story distributed somewhat democratically among members of his inner circle, particularly the narrator, but there are also all of these scenes where you kind of see John Brown the way people might see him if they just met him on one day. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're kind of, you, you get to stand back from him a little bit. And, and the most shocking thing to me as a viewer was how often John Brown and his, and his, and his band of guys encounter people who kind of, they, their attitude kind of seems to be, I don't really have a dog in this hunt. I hope you'll just yeah, move yeah, along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I like made that. me wonder if like maybe an in, infinitesimal percentage of people at that time actually had an opinion on this. Well, you know, do the research, you know, I mean, I mean, the people who paid for the Southern Civil War were a handful of rich people. Most of those, most of those Confederate soldiers thought that they were fighting the war of Northern aggression. They've been lied to the same way people get lied to now. 
you know, they get misled about what, who is this war really in the best interest of, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, I, I've, I would be misquoting, but there was a time when I knew the facts about, you know, this, it's way, way under 10% of people who lived in the South had a slave, you know, I mean, right. most, most people were dirt poor themselves, regardless right. of their background or lineage or complexion. Um, does not mean that they were 100% fine with, you know, another race being treated abominably, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or maybe they weren't fine with it, but they just didn't feel like it was their fight. I mean, you know, one of the, one of the moments in the show that I love that speaks to that is you can hear there's some accounts of Jeb Stewart's account. You know, Jeb Stewart had some run-ins with John Brown back in bloody Kansas. And then Jeb Stewart was there at the raid at Harper's Ferry. And he tells an incredibly funny tale that, you know, I reenact, which I just love, which is Jeb Stewart said to him, you know, what is it you want? And he said, the, the freedom of every, you know, child stolen from Africa in the United States, you know, and he said, well, that's not going to happen today. I mean, what do you want today? And he said, I, I, I want safe passage over the B&O bridge. And he's like, I'm never going to be able to give you that. What do you want? What can I, what, what do you want that I could give you? And, and John Brown said, hundred yard head start. <laughs> I, I just, I was like, that has to go in the movie. I mean, yeah, yeah. it shows just how silly and human it all is. Just give me a head start. <laughs> so I, I, I wanted to talk to you just for a minute about your, about your performance. Um, and for starters, there is this phrase that I heard from a, from an actor friend that the body doesn't know that you're acting. Mm -hmm. The body doesn't know that you're acting. The, your mind knows, but the body doesn't know. And so I'm watching you playing John Brown, particularly in those scenes where he's worked up into a, into a rage, an absolute rage, like he is possessed by God himself. And your voice changes, your body changes. Uh, I've never heard a voice like that coming out of you before. And I'm wondering, uh, where does the voice come from? Where does the posture come from? What are you channeling? What does that feel like when you're when you're playing John Brown at his absolute peak of anger? Well, I've spent my life uh, studying my profession, you know, uh, and you know I, I've come to feel that one lifetime is not enough, you know that it, that when it works well there is something shamanistic about it, you know, and, but in order to invite that kind of, for lack of a better word, inspiration into your life requires a tremendous amount of discipline. I mean, I've spent my life studying body language and vocal work and vocal exercises and what is your real voice and what is an affectation? How do we develop our affectation over you know when we're babies we have the possession of so many different octave ranges you know uh it's it's through our learned behavior that we shape a voice and that voice is very very flexible like almost all the muscles in our in our body are extremely flexible and we're influenced by so many things and so to that end you can rewire your brain you know you can rewire how you're thinking and experiencing things and, and posture. You know, I, I do things like, well, if, if there was a statue of John Brown and I was a sculptor, what body position would I put him in? You know, it's just an interesting question. If he were speaking, what register would he speak in? And you start to discover things. And then there's other things like, well, what would he have in his pockets? Now there's a key to your imagination because all right, did he have any pets? There's all these strange questions you can start to ask. When he prays, how does he pray? Is he a shouter? Is he, does he pray quietly to himself? Does he recite from the prayer book? Does he make it up? What, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of religious zealots. And in, it's a very old fashioned way of, of saying, you know, you have to come up with your character's biography. And, and it's important to understand that I didn't feel I was playing John Brown. I was playing James McBride's John Brown as told through this character of his own creation, Onion. And so there's some keys like, yes, I want a little bit of authenticity. I'll go to the gravesite. I'll look in a mirror that he looked in. I find that very powerful. The idea that one, 
if you went back in time, John Brown's face is in the same mirror that my, like I'm standing in his shadow. You know, there's something, I'm breathing the same atmosphere. That's very powerful. But you start to, well, I started to think about Onion and Joshua, my friend, the actor, and he's looking at me and Joshua often looked at me the way that I looked at older people when I was younger and that it felt like they were always yelling at me. And I started running with that. I started, I just always thought that older people were, yell, especially if they were religious or political, you, you know, it always felt like they they were yelling. So I just kind of cranked that up a notch. And then through those kinds of exercises, you start thinking, well, how the hell would he walk into a battlefield? Why, why, why is he taking all this stuff to heart? And it is true that whoever said that, I, I say that too, your body doesn't know that it's acting. And, and it's, it's very true. I've often punched stuntmen in the face um, and spent the week apologizing. You know, I mean, you get, you get caught up in it. And a disciplined actor does not punch the stunt person in the face, right? You know, but I, I, we all fail sometimes. And, and my wife would tell you, she, you know, she's producing and often, if you're shouting at people all day in a scene work, and then you go have a production meeting and you still have on the long beard. And yeah, now I got a baseball hat and, you know, a pen in my hand and I'm like, but all of a sudden I find myself yelling at the Showtime executive, right? And my wife is saying, what is going on with you? But you've taught your body that this is the response. This is the correct response to somebody standing in my way. I'm gonna bully them, you know? And you're, it's almost, I, I had it when I was going through, when you do a really great piece of writing like Macbeth or something, the Macbeth in a lot of it's, a lot of ways, I came to view as an incantation. It is, it is a total incantation to a malevolent spiritual force on this planet. Like, I mean, I'm not, I sound a little mystic and crazy there, but if you say these lines over and over again, these dark thoughts come to you. It does and feel that way. You're teaching your body these very dark thoughts mm -hmm. about the value of hurting other people and the value of power over others. You're teaching, your, you're saying it over and over again and words have power, mm -hmm. you know? You tell somebody you love them, you, it's, you make their day. You tell them that if you're sincere, you know, yes. I mean, if they feel your sincerity, that you're really funny, I really like you, that feels really good. Well, the inverse is true. That kind of hate language and stuff has a, uh, has a power as well. How many so times? How many times in your life have you just decided I'm going to be this person's friend, and then you're their friend? Sometimes that's all it takes is to say it. it. It is very true. You know, people. It's so strange. How often have you been able to pull yourself out of a depression by smiling? Hmm. Uh, it, it's, and it is. I, I've had that happen too. You know, with people you're struggling at work with or something, and you just say, you know what? I'm not going to fight with this person anymore. I'm going to see the world from their point of view. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you realize it's possible to see it yeah. from there. You like, oh, and you start going like, oh, these old expressions, walking another man's moccasins, you know, what all these ancient expressions, you know, like, right, right. See her point of view. Um, well, that's an actor's job. You know, you start standing in this person's shoes and seeing the world from there. And, and the body starts to happen and the voice starts to happen. Now, a good actor, you know how to get every performer, does not music, dance, you have blocks, things that where your own ego is in your way or your own past experiences. You, you can call them blocks, you can call them whatever you want. And as you get older, you get better. I mean, if you have the luxury of, of having to collect experience, you realize how you can move through those blocks and how you can let these feelings pass in and out of you. Mm -hmm. And so you, and, and the more, then you don't have to be scared and you can let them just bounce through you. And that's probably way more than you wanted of, as an answer, but- uh, No, it's, it's great, it's, it's great. And it, and it also gets me thinking about, you know, the, the extraordinary, John Brown was such an extraordinary individual in so many ways that I think it's easy to forget and this is also true of a lot of major historical figures, that he was ordinary as well. 
And the miniseries also shows us the ordinariness of John Brown, particularly through comedy. Like I, I, I still laugh thinking about all these scenes where, you know, they're going from point A to point B on some mission. And he says, now let's have a prayer. And you see everybody going, oh God, oh, God. here we go. Can we not do the prayer, John? Because yeah. they know they're going to be here all day. It's just so human. I mean, I used to feel that way about my dad, you know? <laughs> He's just like, oh, thank you're about that Thanksgiving. And let's take a minute and say thanks for this turkey. And let's say, you know, and and uh, and so you imagine if my dad was tough, imagine what John Brown was like, right. you know? Right, it's and like it's, chapter one, I am born, you know, and like an hour yeah. later, you eat the turkey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no. What would you say is, uh, looking back on it, what would you say was the most difficult aspect of this production, like getting it right? Super, super difficult to get everyone on board with the tone, you know, uh, because let's face it, if you make anything in this world and you do it whole hog and you put your whole heart into it, not everybody's going to like it. And if you're talking about very difficult subjects, you're going to piss people off. Some people are going to think it's inappropriate to have a sense of humor about a subject matter as hurtful and painful as this one. Uh, I disagree. You know, I feel that there's a, a healing power in comedy. I've learned more from comedians in my life who have made me see alternate points of view. But this subject matter is very dour. And like when I would tell people I was making a movie about John Brown, they would get a very pious look on their face. It was like, oh, that that must be very important. <laughs> and what, what the, the, sub, the subtitle there is, I don't want to see that, you know? Yeah, right. That, you know, and so you're, you're at war with this energy where people are saying, better be respectful. And also, if you're respectful, uh, I don't want to see it. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a weird, I had a great Shakespeare teacher once who said that if you love Shakespeare, you know, then you have to be his friend. And you got to tease him and tweak him and play with him like he was a, a peer. You know, you if you put him up here, you mm. know, uh, every historical story you've ever been told has a point of view. And mm. oftentimes that point of view has the pretense of the truth. Yeah. And what I loved about McBride's writing is he never said this is true. You mm. know, this is the diary of a 14 year old fictional kid in who you know, goes around the West in a gunfight wearing a dress, right? right? He claims to have met Frederick Douglass. He claims to have met Harriet Tubman. He claims he rode with John Brown at Harper's Ferry. This is a bullshit artist of the first order, right? So now all of a sudden you're, it, it's, it's the thing I loved about it. But when you're dealing with such serious subject matter, a slave insurrection, um, people being killed, that all this stuff that really happened, it feels super inappropriate to have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if we didn't keep our sense of humor, we were gonna lose the originality and what was unique about this story. I'm not saying you couldn't tell a great story a, a different way. Sure. I'm just saying that this was McBride's story. And I shook this man's hand saying, I was gonna honor this book, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, and I, I went down swinging that way. And the hardest thing, was getting the studio, the production design, the costume design, the performances, the music, getting everybody to understand how serious we were and how it, we were still gonna be funny. That was the razor's edge to walk. The, uh, I had a, a friend of mine who was a Methodist minister uh, made the distinction of uh, church versus Sunday school the sermon versus Sunday school. And he said, you know, he always wanted uh, his, his homilies to feel like it was Sunday school with a small group of people, not a guy giving a speech at the front of the church. And I think you did that. I think well, it feels like, you know, it feels like if, if we are looking at this in a religious way, it does feel like Sunday school with, you know, a cool pastor. You know, no, it doesn't I'm, feel like we're being talked at. I'm moved to hear you say that. Um because uh because why why am i so moved to hear you say that part of it has to do with i grew up in a house you know where my uh 
you know, when my mother was, uh, I guess, uh, 16 when MLK was murdered, you know, and mm -hmm. she's a, she taught my Sunday school when I was growing up, you know, she's a very uh, serious person and a serious thinker. And she kind of, I grew up in a house where I was taught that, you know, one of the great failures of my mother's generation was that the white Christian community did not, of her generation did not respond appropriately to the murder of MLK, that everybody thought that that was going to be the galvanizing force that would make systemic change in this country and that, you know, education would start to change and zoning would start to change and laws would start to change about loans and about, you know, all the different ways in which this country remains segregated. And uh, so there's, there's something about a responsibility of a country that feels itself as Christian to, uh, to express the values of the Sermon on the Mount in their actions. Yes, we you know, failed so badly, so badly. We failed so badly, and, you know, we, we failed to stand up with, you know, the brothers and sisters from all complexions and all ancestry. You know, we've really, we've really failed at that. And so if I was a Sunday school, you know, sometimes these ideas of faith and God, they're, they're more troublesome than they are beneficial because they serve to divide people. And one of the things that moved me about this story was its ultimate, McBride has a real humanist vantage point and he really looks at everybody with love from the biggest sinner to the, to the, the most upright. And, and he sees the hypocrisy in all of us. And I felt that it'd be wonderful to give a, a little homily about John Brown that was very digestible and fun. I find the scene in the jail cell uh, before he's hung, one of the best pieces of writing I ever came across, you know, uh, that when Onion finally comes to him dressed as a man and they stand there as, you know, as friends. I mean, it's yeah. core, it's a love story between these two men, right? You know, yeah. and, um, and he says that great line about there's an eternity ahead of us and there's an eternity behind us and there's this speck right in the middle and that's our life. And what are we going to do with it? Yeah. And uh, it's so it's so beautiful. Uh, so I don't know. I'll tell you one funny story since we're talking about Sunday school. When I was meeting McBride, uh, you know, I, I was going to kind of, I forget exactly what I was showing. I was going to show him an outline of how we were breaking down the book and uh, his church is near my house, you know, so I, I said, oh, I'll meet you after he, he runs the choir over there at his church. And I, uh, I rode my bike over there and I like I opened the door after the service and this woman came out and she said, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, the air conditioner is over there. If you just go up the stairs, you can fix it. Shouldn't be a, too big of a deal. I'm like, oh no, I, I'm not here to fix the AC. I'm, I'm here to meet James McBride. And she's like, look, the AC's over there, right? And McBride walks out and she goes, and he, he says to this woman, he goes, that's Ethan Hawke. She goes, who the hell's Ethan Hawke? And he says, do you ever see Training Day? And she looked at me, she was like, oh my God, what are you doing here? The last time we had a white guy at this church, he was here to fix the air conditioning. I was just sure that was who you are. <laughs> and, and McBride and I just laughed that it was probably 2018, 2019 or so. We laughed like, can you believe here we are in the, you know, enlightened, woke Brooklyn, New York, where everybody's supposed to be integrated and hip. And, you know, they think you're here to fix the AC. You know, we got to tell stories about, we got to start giving each other permission to talk, you know, and, and hear each other. And so I, I felt, I don't know, I, I it's just, it was a thrilling project to be involved in. Wonderful. Well, it was really great talking to you. And I hear my daughter playing piano downstairs, and that means it's time to wrap it up. Oh, well, well, listen, you were great to talk to you. And I, I wish you and Frankenheimer got to make your movie. But hopefully <laughs> there'll be as many movies of Harper's Ferry now as there, there have been about the Alamo. Well, know? yours was much more interesting <laughs> than mine would have been. Well, I'll tell you that. Because it, because, because it, was, because it was not... Uh, locked in the head of John Brown and completely devoid of humor and just a bunch of violence and righteousness, you know, like, I think it's much more interesting to have the, all the mix of tones that you have. 
Um, I, I, so just, it has that, it has that Catch-22 Dr. Strangelove type of humor where, you know, my favorite kinds of, uh, some of my favorite kinds of movies and TV shows are where you laugh and then you think, should I have laughed at that? Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Because that makes, that, that's, then now your brain's working like, wait, am I a bad person that I just laughed at that? Wait, right. no. and you're questioning yourself. Yeah. What I mean, you should you know, be doing anyway. Lenny Bruce, Richard Pryor, Chris Rock, they've been doing that to us for years. And, you know, McBride has some of that in him. Yep. Anyway. All right. Well, it was great to talk to you. Take care. Great and talking to you. Luck. All right. All the best.